we're going to now move on to our next speaker, who's going to be Dario Canone. Um, so Dario is a data scientist with a PhD in physics with over eight years of experience in data science and machine learning in industry. He is interested in end-to-end -end data science processes and has experience in building, deploying, and integrating machine learning applications into business processes. He led the team of data scientists at a leading provider of credit-related outsourcing in Italy. Two years ago, he moved to the UK and joined faculty as a senior data scientist. His talk will be on simple and constrained LLM agents. If you can both all put your hands together for, for Dario. Thank you. And here's my, here's my presentation. Cool. Um, nice. Today I would like to talk about simple and constrained LLM agents. So this is the agenda. Uh, I would like to start with talking about the client we as faculty helped, and their business, and the problem we solved. And then we'll try to understand why we needed an LLM agent to solve the problem and why, in our case, we think that simple was better than complex, and we will finish with the benefits and limitations of our strategy. But before we start, let me just spend like 30 seconds introducing faculty and myself. So faculty is an applied AI company specialized in designing, building, um, and operating custom and high-performance AI systems and I am working as a senior data scientist at faculty uh, since 2022. I feel like very lucky to work with amazing scientists, brilliant engineers. It's a really good place to work. I have now more than eight years of experience in data science, which makes me feel a bit old sometimes. Um, and in my career, I have contributed to a wide variety of projects with a rather important engineering component, which I like. Uh, some examples are real-time email and document classification systems for an Italian fintech company, and then real-time recommender systems for a major academic publishing company, and more recently, LLM applications for this leading UK fintech company that provides banking services. And this is the project I would like to talk to you about today. It's not just my project, also Ryan is in the crowd, and Luke, Brandon, Devish, Robbie, Dawn, and Joe worked on this. So first of all, thank you to the whole, to the whole team. Cool. Done with the introduction. Let's start. Um, so our client, this client, is a UK fintech company that manages a financial platform that provides accounts, cards, payments, and many other banking services to their um, customer. They have a contact center as usual, and every year the contact center manages millions of customers' interactions, either via phone, email, or chat. The goal of our project was to help them make the uh, contact center more productive, improving speed and quality of answers, which in turn improves customer satisfaction. So how does a contact center work? We might all have this experience when calling our energy providers. Uh, we are the customer on the left, we want to talk with the company. The first thing that happens, we are put in a queue until the first uh, available operator can speak with us. And when we can, then they will help us solve our problems. What kind of problems might we need to, do we need to ask to, to those uh, operators? Well, in one, there is one class of problems which are probably simple problems that we could actually solve ourselves, but we didn't know, or we didn't know how, to, how we could do that, or how to find information about that. If we were the company and wanted to make this part of the problem more efficient, one way to do that is to try to redirect the customers to web pages where this information is written, uh, frequently asked questions. So you would like build a chatbot, for example, to, to put in front of the queue so the customer doesn't even reach the operators. There is a second class of problems, though. Uh, there are problems that the customers uh, can't even solve themselves. So they really need to speak with someone. In that case, the operators will need to do manual background tasks to solve your problem. Either looking 
up for documents in the knowledge base or unblocking your cards or giving you like statements of something so they will really need to do some something for you and they have like many tools and external services they will need to use to provide you with your with, with what you need this is the part of the problem we wanted to optimize and if you want to optimize this then you are thinking about helping the operators not the customers you want to be able to assist them in our case with some gen ai to make their uh, to help them perform their tasks in an easier and faster way. So what we built is an operator-facing LLM-powered chatbot to easily retrieve information from the company's knowledge and databases. So in ideally, while, it, while now the operator to solve like problems like the customer can't make their payments and it's the third time they're trying and now their card is blocked, they don't know why and they just want the payment to, to go through. To solve this complex, complex problem where they would actually need to either remind or know what freezing a card means and how to unblock this card and what this transaction have to do with all of this, Instead of doing all, all this in different tools, they have just one single entry point, which is a chatbot. They can ask questions to do the work for them. So in this case, they, could, they would ask this chatbot to retrieve the details of these transactions, and then the status of the card, and then why a card can be frozen, and how to uh, unfreeze the card, so that they can then take their actions or decisions and get back to the customer with a, final, uh, with a final answer. So we want to build this kind of tools. The idea behind all of this is that we don't need just an LLM to do that. We need an LLM agent. Let's try to think about why. So the requirements for, for this, if we have these example questions here, like about transactions, about cards, about processes, um, it's clear that this chatbot should know internal policies and processes of the company. It should also be able to query multiple databases in real time. It needs to, very importantly, understand when to do what. And finally, we also want it to reply in natural language because we want to make our, the, the life of our operators easier. So, cool. LLMs seems like a good starting point. It's very well known that they are very well known for their ability to generate natural language text following instructions. Um, now, behind LLMs, there are like huge and complicated neural networks, uh, but for the purpose of this talk, an LLM for me is just an API provided to me by OpenAI, Anthropic, that I can just call with a simple snippet of code like this one, uh, where I send some text to them, and I will receive some text in, in response. Um, uh, but, so this is a good starting point, but it's definitely not enough. Two main reasons. First, the LLM does not, knows nothing about the data of this company. And second, the knowledge of the LLM is fixed at the time this, the training for the model was, was done. So we need to go beyond this and provide some external information to the LLM. People overcome this problem with retrieval augmented generation, which you might have heard, is a uh, method to combine a document retrieval component with the LLM in order, in order to solve tasks that require external knowledge to be solved. So in this case, you start with your question, how to unfreeze a card. The first step that this uh, method does is to do a semantic search in a knowledge base of documents that, that you have and the part would pick the most similar documents to the question with the hope that the answer to the question is that. Then you extract this chunk of text from this document and you provide this text to the context, so the prompt, for a new call to the LLM where you now ask the LLM, please answer this question given the context that I've just uh, provided, provided you. So we definitely need this component for our chatbot but not that alone, because we also need to query other things, not just text. We need to query transaction databases, for example. That's, and to understand when to do what. So that's why we need to go beyond 
rock and think about an LLM agent. We can interpret an agent as an engine able to make automated decisions on which external tools to use, then interact with these tools and uh, retrieve the response and finally return the final response. So another example, if the question was, what are the details of the most recent transaction? The first thing that this agent should do is to understand whether it needs to query a database to answer this question. And if yes, which one? Then it needs to retrieve this data and finally come back to you with, a, with an answer. Now, if we want to build such an agent, we have mainly two <coughs> possibilities. Either we try to build a complex and unconstrained agent, or a simple and constrained. We went for the second one. Um, but let me start from the complex and unconstrained to, under to help you understand why we actually did the opposite way around instead. So unconstrained agents, I'm using here a like, popular example in the literature, the React agent. React stands for reasoning and acting. So with this kind of agent, the idea is that you try to use the LLM to simulate a sort of thinking process. So this example on the left is from the, from the, from, from the paper, but the most important part of the slide is the right-hand side of the slide. The, what you're trying to do, instead of asking the LLM just answer this question, is to ask the LLM to think about the question, whether and whether it needs to call external tools, and then you would call the tools, get back with an observation of what you extracted, and in case, go back at the beginning. Then you think again, and then, if you, and, and then you go on in, in this loop until the LLM thinks that uh, it has the final answer and get back to you with all the sequence of, um, of, of thought. Another way to think about that in pseudocode, you could interpret the uh, React agent as a simple function that where you have a, a question as an input. The first thing that you do is to concatenate the question to the React prompt, which contains the instruction uh, for this, and then you enter this, this loop. So you call the LLM, you invoke the LLM, and pass the output and split it in a thought part and an action part. Now, if the action is not end, so the LLM doesn't think it has all the information to solve the task, the action is then a tool that needs to be used. So I use the tool. This could be calling APIs, search, Google search, and, I don't know, SQL queries. Uh, get the observation out of it and concatenate everything into a new LLM input, which now contains the old one, plus the thought, the action, and the observation, and start back again. Now, the second call to the LLM contains all of this. And again, you ask, think if you have the final solution or to use another action. And you go over and over again until the action is end, and at that point, you return with all the sequence of thought and observation and actions that the LLM did. This is super interesting and potentially very powerful. Uh, however, it isn't what we needed, mainly for two reasons. So first of all, you have when you start with this agent, you have almost no idea of what's happening. You will have an output at some point. But uh, it's completely out of your control. Like you're giving the LLM the freedom to go where it wants. Uh, the second problem is that because of the loop nature of all of this, you can do like you may need many steps to reach to a final solution. So LLMs are slow. If you have ever tried them, in general they are slow. And um, this means that this tool will be slow, but we're actually doing the opposite thing, that is making the, agent, making the operators faster. Uh, so it's not going to work. More in uh, detail, we are talking about the unpredictability of this kind of uh, architecture, because the decision loop is a big black box. And specifically in our scenario, we are talking about a financial institution like uh, that provides banking services, this lack of reliability here means lack of trust. Second problem is the latency. We said if we have multiple calls to the LLM, we might be very, very slow. 
And also, if you remember from the pseudocode, we were concatenating inputs, which means longer and longer prompts, which means slower and slower requests to the, to the LLM. Third aspect, actually connected to the first one, is it is really hard to evaluate. There is almost no way to inspect what's happening in the loop and evaluate the inter internal thought process of this kind of agent. Those are the main reasons why we went for the simple and um, constrained solution. So what do I mean with simple and constrained? Instead of trying to simulate a thinking loop, we decide in advance what's the workflow the LLM agent will always follow. So starting from a question, the first thing we ask the LLM just to do one thing. We describe the tools the LLM has available, and we ask it to return only the subset of tools it thinks it will need to query to solve the question. Then we take this list and go to the second phase, the query phase. Here, we just ask the LLM to give us the right parameters to do the right requests, either API calls or, um, or uh, queries everywhere, and then the execute the queries. With the results, we go to the third and final phase, which is the summary phase, where we do a sort of a RAG-style uh, prompt, and we ask the LLM to answer the initial question given the context that we extracted. Now we look one by one at each of these phases just to understand better what I meant. Plan phase, this is an, this is an example uh, prompt. Let's take a look at the two main parts. In the first part, as we said, we are first of all describing to the LLM what are the tools it will uh, have uh, available to query. Examples here, in our case, tool number one, the internal wiki, where all the processes and documents and policies are described. Here is where we could do RAG, for example. The LLM doesn't need to know, we need to do RAG, it just needs to know what there is, what, what what's this tool is. Sec tool number two, it could be a transactions API that we could use to retrieve the details of specific transaction. Tool number three could be, I don't know, the database of cards that we could query to find details of, of cards. In the second part of the prompt, we ask the LLM to respond with the list of tools that we would need to answer the initial question. So in, if the question, for example, is, is it possible to cancel transaction with this specific ID? What we expect from the plan phase is two tools. Tool number one, it would tell us that we will need to query the internal wiki, asking how to cancel a transaction. What's the process to do that? Tool number two, it will tell us that we'll need to query the transactions API to understand what are the details of this specific transaction. Now we have this JSON list. We go to the second uh, phase. In the second phase, we know all the tools. So we know that for the internal wiki, we need to do RAG. So we do RAG on the internal wiki in the standard way. We embed the question, do semantic search, and extract the chunk of text that uh, is similar to the question, so that, that it's likely to contain the answer. For the second tool, we know that we, want to, that we need to call the transaction API. We don't know the parameters yet, so which transaction, which ID. So we ask the LLM to solve this problem for us and to give us the right parameters to do this specific query only. We have the results at the end of this phase. We have everything to actually find, respond with the final answer, which happens in the summary phase, where we ask the LLM just to respond to the initial question given what we extracted from the query phase. To summarize all of this, what we did was to abandon the idea of the uh, simulating the thinking loop, and instead we're using the LLM just to wrote the questions to tools, find the parameters to run the, to run the queries, and summarize the retrieved context in a final answer. Good, so fine, what are the benefits and limitations of this, of this approach then? Benefit number one, it is more predictable and more reliable. 
The main point is that we are always asking the LLM to solve very specific tasks and expect very specific outputs. In the plan phase, we are asking just to give us a list of tools with the questions that we would need to uh, run against those, those tools. So it's a JSON list. Um, and in particular, one interesting like, consequence of this is that it's, it, we, know, we always know when this tool is off topic, which is quite a nice safety feature for a financial situation, because if we ask what's the weather like today, this phase would answer with an empty list. So we could immediately say, no, this is not a question I will, uh, I will answer. So the workflow can stop reliably if we don't, have the, if we don't code ourselves the data sources to solve the, to solve the task. The, if we instead focus on the second part, where we ask only to find the right parameters, given the schema, for example, of, a, of an API, um, this, again, is very reliable because tools are always limited in scope, and uh, the parameters that LLM chose can be validated even before running the query. So we never go in this banking databases with queries that either do not make sense or actually make sense, but are wrong or even dangerous. Benefit number two, connected to this one, is that this makes the tool measurable in the internal thinking, uh, in the internal uh, loop also, not just the output. In particular, we can inspect the intermediate results and compare them to known answers and try to compute performances. One question that we could ask ourselves is, how good is the LLM at picking the right data sources? Well, we have a JSON list of data sources out of any question, so we can compare to a data set of known answers and say, as in our case, OK, we have a 96% of accuracy in the plan phase. These are numbers of a real experiment, one of our first experiments with, with this, um, using GPT-4 on a sample of 279 questions. Are quite cool numbers, I would say. Um, the second question we could ask ourselves is, OK, then how good is the LLM at picking the right parameters to run the correct queries? And also in this case, we can just compare the um, request that the LLM would do with the request that we would do to solve that question. And again, in this case, we have a quite amazing 94% accuracy here, which means that 94% of the times we are going in the summary phase, which is the generative, like specifically generative AI phase, with the right data to answer a question. Benefit number three, it is faster. We abandon the idea of the, of the loop, which means that we have now maximum three sequential uh, steps, three sequential calls to the LLM, which is the slowest part of this, of this agent. Um, and also, it means that we can easily query, we can parallelize the query part. So if the plan phase tells us we need four different tools to solve a question, we can run queries against these tools all at the same time. In our production environment, when we deployed, after we deployed this, and we, like, yes, we measure this, um, we have a median latency of 14 seconds for all the, um, all the workflow. Cool. Limitations. So the benefit of being simple and constrained is also its own limitation. The first aspect of this is that it has a restricted perimeter of use. The ability of the plan phase to reliably short circuit when off-topic questions are asked can also limit the scope of the chatbot. Let's think about an example, like a question like, the customer sent me this message in a language I don't understand. Can you translate it to English? This is something that even ChatGPT can do. In our case, we are actually constraining ourselves on not being able to do that and answer with, I'm sorry, I don't have enough information to answer this question. You can say, fine, but why, if, why don't you add a translator tool in, the, your, in your tool list? Yes, you can, but it's easy to understand that this is not scalable. You are constraining yourself. It becomes less general. The second aspect of this loss of generality is that it is hard to answer multiple step questions 
We abandon the idea of the loops, so it is actually harder to answer questions that need multiple interdependent queries to the data. The example here is, could you give me all the data needed to close an account? This would require first to read the documents understand and understand what data is needed, and a second query that is now get me the data. There is no loop, so this agent, in principle, can't do anything about, about that question. I would like to conclude with a question you might have. It is, okay, fine, but what's the best strategy for LLM agents then? Um, unfortunately, I don't know, like, it depends. Uh, we saw complex and unconstrained agents. They are very general. They could potentially solve very complicated tasks as they try to simulate a thinking process. However, they can be very unpredictable and hence unreliable, and multiple steps make them slower. This wasn't the right choice for us in the scenario of a contact center for this uh, financial, um, for this fintech company. Instead, we decided to go for simple and constrained agents. They are generally more stable, fast, and reliable. In the scope perimeter, they are built for. The main limitation is that they, ha they have much less freedom and more restrictions in their behavior. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dario. Uh, yeah, do we have any questions from the crowd? Excellent talk, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you uh, approached an even simpler approach, which is to perhaps model every single user journey in some kind of gigantic decision tree, and then use the LLM to understand where to intercede. And mm -hmm. you know, from there, you would have a much more limited scope in which you could you know, go into a RAG and then a natural language response. Thanks, that's a good question. Um, we, the difficult point of this approach is modeling the tree. It's the main limitation. Um, it is hard to model a tree when the problem is actually very broad. Like you don't really, really know what the customer will need from you. So it's not like the simple, uh, you remember, you, let's go to the first, one of the first slides where we had like, um, this, yes. So for this situation, having a sort of decision tree is what actually companies do when you, like you might, we might all have the experience of this, like talking with a chatbot that is not really clever and say, oh, well, it's this or that, and then this or that. This is what you, this could be useful here. For these other case where more complex problems are there, you might want some more generality and you don't really know what to expect. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for the talk. It's very insightful. Um, you mentioned that the model has problems with like multi-step processes, but what if the operator sort of breaks the question down into two, and would the model eventually be able um, to also let the user know, like, hey, this is a very like big task for me. Could you maybe break this down so that I can have it in like two separate queries? Cool. So the plan phase um, tries to break everything down into, uh, into smaller subtasks, but I guess your question means, what if it can't? Uh, so by default, it will give you probably an incomplete answer. And then, as you said, yes, it's up to the operator, to the user who is using that, to try to rephrase the, to rephrase the question. Um, you might go beyond that, like adding memory and then thinking loop, and then you are back in the React style of agents. Probably you can be in between the two, but uh, yeah. So it's not like the contextual rag that it like picks up also the first question and then the uh, The point is that there are no loops, so it's more a question and answer. Like this is a question, this is the answer, probably the thing that you would find is that the answer is not satisfactory to you. It's like ChatGPT not giving you exactly, exactly what you asked for, and then you need to rewrite the question, and then you try it again, but it's not exactly that, and then you do it again. <laughs> Hi. 
Hi, thanks for the talk. The examples of the code were really helpful. Um, my question is around the security. So you mentioned you worked with a financial institution. Uh, is this like an inference only model? How did you get? How did you kind of get the client to trust uh, the LLM that you've you worked with? This is a thanks. This is a very good question. Um, so. First of all, the main reason why this is was this was okay is that this is not a tool for the general public. This is a tool for experienced people in the company. This is already like a first protection. Like this is people hired by this company, first of all, um, which makes the problem lighter, not solved. Um, there are safety. Um, measured, built in uh, by design. For example, um, one example could be the in the query phase, the worst that can happen, uh, the worst that can happen here when you try to query the transaction database, for example, is that the question is about customer A, but then when you ask the LLM to give you the parameters, the parameters is customer B, because it hallucinates in some way, and then you answer to customer to about a question about customer A with the data of customer B, which is the worst possible thing. Okay, we didn't try to solve this with the LLM. We just said the LLM doesn't choose the ID. The ID is given to the software part of the, of the agent. So it's instead of trying to solve safety with the LLM, it's just don't ask the LLM to do things that you don't trust it to do. Um, brilliant talk. Um, I really appreciate the fact you said this scene because I didn't see it in many talks. Not today, in general, you know, when people are quick to jump to the technical solution, what was the problem you're solving? So, yeah, really good. So, my question is simple. So, would you fine tune your LLM here? Or would you just use the open AI, you know, chat GPT, for example, and do everything you're doing here? Or do you think it's necessary to like tune the LLM for these? specific domains so this is like in production right now there isn't a tuned LLM so there is a GPT-4 Anthropic Claude 3 whatever like actually you can you can choose but there isn't a the a, a fine-tuned uh, LLM um, I guess you might uh, have better results with fine-tuning I think the problem that actually uh, made us think, let's not start with fine-tuning, is, again, the problem about the data the, um, that, that you have here. Like, you, want to, you might want to fine-tune these models with PII data. So what if the LLM, at some point, instead of, asking, instead of trying to respond to this question about customer A, just because in the training that you use for fine-tuning had the data about some other customer, then hallucinates using this other data, like, we thought this problem as a hard problem to solve, so we first went to production with this, and then as a second step, we might consider fine-tuning. Hi, thanks. Um, you mentioned one of the problems with uh, React is this uh, difficulty of measuring its internal thought process and how you overcame this in the, in the setup you've got. I was wondering if that has benefits for the end users, not just the people who are building these systems? Does it help build transparency for the operator in any way? And do you have any thoughts on that? Thanks. Um, let's go back to the, to what, to here. Yes. So yes, these were measures. So what we did is to use, this is a, very good point, thanks. So it's not just about measurability, it's also about transparency in, transparency. in particular, we know the faces, we know what's happening, so for example, we can just output these references. Like, to answer this question, the internal wiki was queried, and this was the question asked to the internal wiki. And also, like, we extracted this information from this document, from RAG. So we can use the intermediate outputs of the faces and surface them to the customer to help with the reliability of this. 
Like to answer this question, we used, we queried the transaction database with these uh, parameters. Thanks. Hello. Yeah, thank you for the for the talk. It was uh, really interesting. Um, I have two questions. My first question would have to do with uh, the frameworks that you're using uh, for the internal part, the intermediate steps. Is that custom framework? Is it? So, yes, it is custom. You might, some of you like might know Langchain. We didn't use Langchain. Uh, I don't know if there is any like developer of Langchain here, so I don't want to like. But uh, it's very complicated. Um, it's very very broad. While we're actually trying to do something very specific, on, and we want control. So that's the main choice. Why we didn't choose Langchain. And the second question has to do with um, for your intermediate steps, um, which model are you using, and what happens if your context window your functions, so all your things in your JSON format, goes beyond the, the context window. Yeah. The only place where you might have problem with the context window is the summary phase. Because from here, like, well, the input question usually from a person, the operator that wants to be, that needs to be fast to answer to the question, won't be like a textbook uh, about Bayesian inference. It will be just a very small question. Uh, here you have a very small output, so no problems with the context window here. Queries, again, no problems with the context window here, like usually API schemas, API schemas it's not about, but there is one point where you might have some problems, which is in the summary, you might have chunk of text retrieved from RAG. So you might want to know how big this chunk of text uh, can be, which is about chunking, so the usual like topic and discussions around how do I chunk text for retrieval of painted generation. Hello, many thanks for a very nice talk. Um, you showed a slide where you have the benefits and, and like uh, the negative points of uh, React and the simple agent. Um, couldn't have the best of both worlds. Basically, maybe add a React-like loop in case the simple agent didn't uh, answer it satisfactorily or completely. Um, I think yes. Like <coughs> at the end of the day, this is software. Like this is engineering. Everything can be done with 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 this. And I think you can try to find something that is still simple but a bit more general. I think the idea of the project, but also like of yes, of of this talk was to probably give you the message that these are two, in my opinion, opposite direction. Like being simple and constrained and being complex and general and unconstrained are two different directions. So when you go in one way, you're actually compromising with the other. Hi, thanks, nice talk. Um, my question's around the production environment that you were talking about and how you deployed it as well. Um, what were this sort of? Can you can you share a bit of experience on what the most unexpected things that happened were when you went to deployment and production? When you handed that over to the company, like what were the things that maybe went wrong that you hadn't anticipated? And then my fo kind of related follow-up to that is, what are the things that you have to do in a kind of maintenance uh, mode with that company yeah. as well? Um, I think the most unexpected was the amount of tickets you need to open to open connections, like in the, in the company, like the, the IT, like the number of tickets you need to open, like the, how to follow this process uh, in a financial uh, scenario. Like, it's, like, I don't know, processes are rigid, can be rigid, but that's probably not giving you <laughs> a lot of information. Um, deployment, um, I think the... So first, first thing, these LLMs, can't, like, you, you don't want your data to go over the internet. So you want like private connections, and you want the LLM like op, op, OpenAI or via Azure giving you OpenAI models to be your connection and your uh, yeah, network, networking part. That was probably the hardest part. I'm not also the most expert in this part. Uh, but 
probably that part was initially a blocker. Uh, once we got that, then the deployment per se with all the Kubernetes stuff was kind of okay. Um, yeah, we can talk more about that later. Uh, just a question about the RAG architecture. So yep. you said that you did not use Langchain. Yes. Uh, what kind of architecture you use for embeddings and like vector database as well? Cool. Um, so let me try to answer this question. How with the with the RAG slide? Yeah. So you're asking about this part. How does this part works? Like semantic and okay. Um, good. The answer is, this is a map-only rag, so we just query the document, extract the document, and give everything to the summary phase, because the summary phase is the reduce part. So the idea is similar to a map-reduce rag, but here you just do the map part. The reduce is all delegated to, the, to this summary phase. About the vector database, uh, nothing too fancy, like Postgres with PG vector. Um, also, like it's not tons of document, so this choice doesn't really, I wouldn't say, yeah, doesn't really matter. Like it's fine. It's not at the moment. Like of course you want to scale, but it's not again like a massive amount of uh, text. Um, I think an interesting point here in the development of this rug part is the chunking uh, strategy. Uh, Initially, we started with a very simple just chunk up to some number of characters. That was kind of okay, but not really the best one. And so, yeah, the interesting part is that actually we didn't solve this problem at the software level, we solved this problem at the process level. So with the company, we decided to clean and rewrite the documents and make the content creators of this document do their own chunks for example, with sections. So the chunking is actually decided by the user, which was, in my opinion, like a really lucky part because there is no better chunking than the chunking you do yourself. <laughs> uh, just a quick follow-up is that um, basically the libraries that you use, for example, Langchain is not, I, would, I wouldn't say it's a production kind of library. What kind of production libraries like, do, you, do you rely on in the development? So I guess if you look at the pyproject.toml file with our libraries, you will find like just Python, like and probably the Psycho PG2 to query the to query Postgres and nothing more. Like it's all very basic Python, basic Python stuff. The vector search is delegated to PG vector extension in Postgres, and yeah, and that's it. <laughs> Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, so, Thank you. Uh, absolutely brilliant talk. I'm really interested in the measurement part. Uh, mm -hmm. We had that slide up for yeah. a while. Because it's not often you see um, testable LLMs. So um, the LLMs are non-deterministic. So if you ask the same question twice, you might get different answers. Did you run it 270 times, uh, 279 times, or multiple times? Uh, yes. There's a bootstrap approach mm -hmm. uh, into this. Uh, of course, like it depends on how much time you want to wait, but the numbers we are getting there at the average over a over a number of um, evaluation on 279 questions. So, for example, five times calling five times all the workflow on all the 279 questions, then you do the average and you find these numbers. You can do like 30, 2,000. It's just a matter of how many days you want to wait. <laughs> Cheeky follow-up question. Um, so you mentioned other models. Did you just test it on GPT-4? And did you see a difference between the GPTs or say the Claude model, for example? Thanks, great question. Uh, yes, we did try with GPT-4 Turbo and GPT-3.5. Uh, uh, the main point is that we are not sure that the measurements are really comparable because the prompts are not comparable. Like model number one might require some prompt, uh, I don't know, you know, like uh, engineering, 
uh, that is specific to the, to the model. So given the same prompt, you change the model, this model is performing worse. But is it because of the model or because of the prompt that you tweaked for the other one? Great. Uh, yeah, we're going to stop there for, for lunch, but if you can give uh, Dario another round of applause. Thanks. So, so yeah, we're going to stop. There's a 45-minute a lunch break. We're going to be back again at 1.15. Uh, Patricia will be taking over the, the MCing, and um, we'll have another couple of, couple of talks here. Uh, so, yeah, th thank you very much, and... Um, See, see you again soon.